Everyone, remain calm. Yeah, ooh, ah, that's how it always starts. But then later there's running and screaming. Somebody talk to me, what is happening? Welcome to Jurassic World. You're listening to the Jurassic Park Podcast. You want to consult here or in my bungalow? <laughs> Hold on to your butt. Well, we're back. Hello and welcome to the 99th episode of the Jurassic Park Podcast. I'm your host, Brad Jost, and we're here to discuss all things Jurassic Park. In this episode, of course, we've got some news for you, followed by a bit of cool audio from Yaroslav Kosmina, featuring a really cool blend of some of the Jurassic scores to create one giant Jurassic Suite composition. It's pretty awesome, so stay tuned for that. We also have a submission from Arjun Boss, who recently wrote a really cool script for a story taking place just after the final moments featured in The Lost World. Well, today he submitted a brief intro and trailer concept for his story, so we'll take a listen to that. After that, I'll read you a bit of an interview from Jeff Goldblum featured in the Fangoria magazine from 1997. I'll also take a look at some of the features on The Lost World inside that magazine. I guess you could say I'm sort of ripping off J Jurassic's segment here. But speaking of J Jurassic, we've got another edition of Amber Finds, reviewing some awesome collectibles from the Lost World era. This time he's looking at the Lost World Field Guide, which is very awesome. And as a bit of a two for one, he included the Talking Viewmaster 3D Viewer. It's another great installment from the Amber Finds host, so stay tuned. Last episode, we caught up with part two of the making of the Lost World. Each episode this month, aside from our big 100th episode, next week, will give you a look at the making of The Lost World. Now, the 20th anniversary is coming up, so we wanted to treat you to some fun audio from the collector's VHS from back in the day. Today, we'll revisit part three of four in the series. Now, for a few weeks, we've been mentioning that we're giving away the Mondo vinyl pressing of the Jurassic World original score featuring the Black Double LP, along with Yaroslav's amazing The Lost World 20th Anniversary print, and also great artwork from J Jurassic made specifically for this giveaway. We'll be giving away a few packages to celebrate our 100th episode, along with the 20th anniversary of The Lost World. Keep an eye out on our social media and websites this week. You may see a giveaway commence. It's another jam-packed episode this week, with yet again more contributors and some awesome listeners, so let's get things started off with a bit of Jurassic news from around the world. 18 minutes and your company catches up on 10 years of research. Access me, program. Access me, security. These pictures were taken in hospital in Costa Rica 48 hours ago. I don't want to jump to any conclusions, but look. Boy, my head being right all the time. But today, I guarantee it. It really seems like every week we're getting some of the coolest dinosaur discoveries ever made, and this past week proved no differently. Found in 2011, the Notosaur has been revealed and it is one of the best preserved fossils that we've seen yet. Of course, I'm sure you've all seen the pictures already, but I cannot get over this thing. It's incredible. Coming from the Ankylosaur family, the Notosaur looks like a nearly intact upper half of the dinosaur featuring the full head, 20 inch spikes, and the bumpy plates along the back. It seems like we're getting to a point where we really don't have to imagine what these creatures look like as we have nearly a full one sitting here in front of us. Please head to the link in our show notes to find an awesome article on the discovery along with some seriously cool pictures from National Geographic. <laughs> Guys, I really I really don't want to read this one. I I should have just made Aaron Bayer read it as he's he's the one who sent it over to me. It seems like Mexico's federal police have intercepted a shipment of contraband goods headed for the United States. Well, what was in it, you ask? Uh, some, some video game cartridges. Now, that doesn't sound too bad, right? Well, why wouldn't I want to read this, you ask? Well, these fake Famicom game cartridges featuring titles like Robocop and Jurassic Park were found smuggling spiders into the United States. You know, hey Mexico, we got enough spiders, you know? Oh God, I'm getting freaked out just reading this. 
These dumb spiders were shipped off, or being shipped off to Maryland, which is obviously too dangerously close to my state, so please, keep these spiders as far away as possible. If you haven't guessed, I really hate spiders, and I'm, I'm freaked out now, I think they're all over me. So yeah, if for some odd reason you really feel inclined to learn more about this story, go ahead, follow the link in our show notes to learn more. <laughs> Jurassic Outpost found an upcoming casting call for the sequel to Jurassic World. Now, if you are a man or a woman with a military look to yourself and you're in Hawaii from June 5th to July 15th, well, you could be up for a lead role. Well, scratch that. A photo double or an extra in the upcoming sequel. It sounds like a great opportunity to me. If only I was in Hawaii. Hmm. How can I make this work? Anyway, head to our show notes for a link to the Outpost's post uh, on the casting call. Oh, there it is. There it is. And now let's take a few minutes to listen to Yaroslav's Jurassic Suite.
Here's an introduction from Arjun Boss along with the trailer to his script. Let's take a listen. Hi, my name is Arjun Boss and several years back I wrote a few fan screenplays on Jurassic Park. Now after Jurassic World I wrote a new one based on those early screenplays to fit the canon. The story is situated around the events of Jurassic Park 3 and I wish to do more with it this time. I had a comic in mind, but my drawing skills are terrible, so now I plan to make it into a radio play and I'm cur currently working on some test recordings. I'd like very much to receive feedback from fans on the story, what they think of it. What follows is a test for a trailer I created so far, but in the end I wish to use separate voices in the story, and if fans would like to participate it could make a fun community project. The story is called Extinction Level Jurassic Park. Hope you guys like it. If we could only step aside and trust in nature, life will find a way. Only moments after the San Diego incident, yeah. that bitter engine made a discovery. They seem to be carriers of a disease. Henry, dear boy, within the next five years, they will all have gone the way of the dodo again. You never told me. We all expected the animals to die quickly through rising deficiency. It didn't matter anymore. Save my animals, Henry. A dark day for InGen, as the former CEO, John P. Hammond, died today. In other news, Maserani Global is now the proud new owner of International Genetics. No, four years later. Simon Masrani finds Tim Murphy. But why me? I'm no scientist. I need someone I can trust on the team that's overseeing security on the island. Call it investor security. If you want to conquer fear, don't sit home and think about it. Go out and get busy. Joined by Sarah Harding. Dr. Harding, welcome on board. I believe you know Mr. Murphy. Why the fenced roof? To keep our drone on. Don't worry about that now. We've got them caged up. We've got a situation. Plane crashed on the island. Velociraptors? We have to investigate them. <laughs> it's the only species that is in. Where's Aunt Claire? 7 o'clock tomorrow night on the East Dock. Make sure he gets it right. But it's alive! And everyone on the planet is going to line up to appreciate it and everything done. People would say they could see the fleas. Oh, I could see the fleas. Mommy, can't you see the fleas? Are, are these characters uh, auto erotic? No, no, no. Come on! This week I decided to infringe on Jay Jurassic's collectible segment here with a bit of my own Amber Finds. Now over Mother's Day while in a collectible shop, actually my mom came across a Fangoria magazine from 1997 featuring the Lost World on the cover. So I thought that was pretty good timing uh, with the anniversary coming up to kind of take a look at some of the highlights of the magazine and the, uh, the main thing I wanted to relay is a great interview slash article on Jeff Goldblum. But before we get there, let's see what else this magazine had to offer in June 1997. Here on the front cover, we have uh, one of those amazing shots from the side of the camper. Uh, you see Sarah screaming on the inside, you see Nick in the background, and you see the giant T-Rex mouth. It says T-Rex Terror on the front cover. It's got the Lost World symbol on the front. Uh, it says Steven Spielberg's scarier sequel. Uh, this is an awesome cover, so retro, so 1997 if you ask me. It's got all the, uh, the awesome coloring that you'd expect actually from The Lost World. This like green and yellow and purple, it, it's so 90s, it's amazing. Uh, but this was an awesome find. My mom came in to, and found me in a different store and she says, Hey, I, uh, I just found something with The Lost World on it. And the, the funny thing was, I was in a retro video game store at the time buying... Uh, the Sega Genesis uh, Jurassic Park uh, Rampage Edition game. And uh, so, of course, I ran right over to the other store and checked out this magazine and pulled out my wallet and tried to buy it. So, yeah, here we go. It's sitting right here in front of me, and uh, it's really awesome. I've never seen this one before. I know a lot of collectors have, uh, have seen it and have wanted it. Um, it's in great condition, too, so that's really awesome. Inside, as I flip through here, it's got... Um, it's got a cool like feature on the Lost World, featuring some really cool shots. Uh, David Cap, we got Sarah Harding here, T Rex, uh, giant article. It's it's huge about David David Cap. I think um, I didn't read through the whole thing yet, but um, yeah, it just features a lot of the pictures from the movie and stuff like that. Nothing too crazy, nothing too behind the scenes or anything like that. Um, let's see what else does it have? Yeah, more pictures from the movie. But one of the things I wanted to read through actually for you guys today is uh, um, a part called Jurassic Survivor featuring a center picture of uh, 
Jeff Goldblum in uh, his quizzical Ian Malcolm pose here from the movie. And uh, why don't we get into it then? Have you heard the joke about two cannibals who are eating a clown? Actor Jeff Goldblum asks in his trademark deadpan demeanor. One says to the other, Hey, does this taste funny to you? It's evident that Goldblum's on-screen charisma is no act, as he displays the same charm and eccentricities that audiences have come to love over the years, right down to his sense of humor. The actor has managed to mix pseudo-intellectual posturing with pathos and warmth in a myriad of memorable characters throughout the years, including transforming scientist Seth Brundle in The Fly, the furry alien who lands in LA and discovers that Earth girls are easy, the cable TV troubleshooter who is the first to discover that the mysterious signals from space in Independence Day are not friendly, and Jurassic Park's mathematician Ian Malcolm, whose assertion that turning man-eating monsters into amusement park attractions isn't the smartest thing in the world is proof Frighteningly correct. I like variety, and I like doing things that are both funny and serious, Goldblum says. When I started, Stanley Eisner said that it takes 20 years to become an actor anyway. It's a worthwhile pursuit to utilize your lifelong appetite for expression in this neat little game of made-up situations and feeling it out like it's real. I love it, and I enjoy doing different things, whether it scares me a little or challenges me. This summer, Goldblum embarks on a first in his career, a sequel. Four years after the original box office behemoth, he returns to the role of Ian Malcolm in Steven Spielberg's The Lost World Jurassic Park, based once again on a novel by Michael Crichton. I really enjoyed the book, and I adore Steven Spielberg, the actor says. I had a great time making Jurassic, and I thought this could be a very good one too. While Goldblum confirms that The Lost World follows the basic story of the book, which, in difference to the movie, brought back Ian Malcolm who died in the original Jurassic novel. There will be some differences. It's the same general idea of the book, he says. The island is still there, but we're doing our version of it. And the dinosaurs totally take us over this time. The general themes of cloning and extinction were very important to Goldblum, who feels that both movies broached the issue without being heavy-handed. Nature has selected species for extinction, and we shouldn't try to change that, he says. Uh, we have the technology to do a lot of things, but we need to be as self-examining and wise with it as we can. Whereas the previous film cast Malcolm as a supporting player to Sam Neill and Laura Dern's primary heroes, the actor now finds himself the star of this latest adventure. It didn't hurt that since Jurassic Park became a huge hit, Goldblum has also starred in another big summer blockbuster, Independence Day. I don't want to count my chickens before they hatch, but I'm optimistic about the future, says Goldblum about the chance that his latest vehicle will be yet another record-breaking release. Finding himself continually drawn into the science fiction world, particularly in scientist roles, Goldblum admits that he's slowly becoming fascinated by these realms himself. I wasn't a science kind of person in school, he says. Now that I'm playing parts that required me to know these things, I'm really getting into this stuff. I'm reading a Carl Sagan book called The Demon Haunted World, and he makes the science seem very human, cool, approachable, sexy, vital, and spiritual. Returning to the role of Malcolm with this newfound knowledge was enticing for Goldblum, who notes that what attracted him to the first Jurassic Park was the character's non-scholarly stance. He he's a smart mathematician, but not an academic, the actor says. He's such an interesting, complicated character and the real voice of reason and sanity. He has a real vision for science and its place, but uh, there was a fun story to tell as well. It was an intricate little dance that Steven helped me with a lot. Goldblum in, in fact grew up loving the very same genre he now stars in when he would visit the local cinema in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania every Saturday afternoon as a child. Uh, we had a beautiful old theater called the Leona, and my sister and I once saw Vincent Price in The Fly, says Goldblum who got to play his own version in David Cronenberg's remake. King Kong vs. Godzilla was another big movie when I was little. I remember it being packed that day. Uh, you couldn't hear anything on the screen. Kids were throwing popcorn boxes. It was great. In between mega-budget screen assignments, Goldblum continually broadens his horizons. He was nominated for a 1996 Academy Award for his short film as a director and also manages to frequently join his adventures of Buckaroo Banzai co-star Peter Weller to play jazz in Los Angeles clubs with their band. But as Goldblum describes it, everything he does is part of a learning process. I uh, still consider myself in training. He says, I'm enjoying every bit of it, especially the acting. It's like somebody who thinks, 
I, I want to dance. I, I love to watch dancing. Then goes to a class and it's thrilling when they show you. It's been fun seeing myself grow because it's what I've always wanted to do. So there you have it. There's the interview from Jeff Goldblum. Back in 1997, I thought it would be pretty interesting to take a look at because we know he's coming up here in the sequel uh, to Jurassic World. So uh, what better to find out where his headspace was back in 1997 when he was doing the first sequel uh, of his career, I guess. And now he's doing another one here with Jurassic. And uh, it's really awesome to see how he compares then versus now. He seems like he's never changed, so I'm really excited to see what he brings in the future. And uh, it's awesome to kind of look back at the Lost World and celebrate all this uh, amazing stuff from this movie. So I hope you enjoyed that, and uh, maybe we'll look at more of this magazine sometime in the future. Who's got some change? He takes quarters. I got like, I got a buck. I got a buck ten. How'd you get it? You don't want to know. Her name, we got it. Where did you get that? I got it on eBay. Then they're expensive. Put them back. He's a dick. Who dropped them? Let's on the move. I had a promise to conduct a very thorough on-site inspection. And get stuff in the sale. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. I got it for $150, but we'll pay it. And then there's the merchandise. I can personally... Donald, it. Donald, this park was not built to cater only for the super rich. That first park was legit. I could write all kinds of numbers on this check. I remember that on InGen's list. It's because it wasn't on their list. This fossilized tree sand, which we call amber. Hello, Jurassic fans. Today, we are going to have a little bit of a double feature. And, of course, we're going to keep continuing to um, celebrate the the month-long um, Lost World celebration. Since this month, uh, it, on the 23rd, it's going to be the 20 years of the Lost World Jurassic Park. Since the Lost World, the anniversary. And so, I'm going to continue this with... Um, some more Lost World items, some more Lost World merchandise. And today we have two items, which I will discuss. One of them is the Talking Viewmaster 3D Viewer. And the other one is a Kodak Premium Field Guide. So let's go with the Field Guide first, real quick. Since, um... This is a pretty cool thing. Now, the field guide, um, both these items I got later on on, like, eBay auctions, so I, I didn't have them since I was a kid. I did have a Viewmaster for Jurassic Park. I, I'm pretty sure I had one, but it, it's not like the one I have here. This one is electronic, and it talks back to you. So, that's different, <laughs> you know, just least say. And so, okay. We're going to go with the map right now. Let's uh, open this guy up. Okay, so let's start off. Um, it is by Kodak. I don't exactly know where this map came from exactly. I know I got it in an auction. Uh, one, of, It was part of like a, a Jurassic Park lot that I won. On the back it says uh, Kodak Premium Processing. Lost World Jurassic Park and you know all the copyright stuff. Universal Studios 1997 copyright you know the it has it's kind of like a little booklet inside and it ha uh, it's, it's a booklet kind of cover and on the inside has a map but the cover itself is really really cool it's it's got an embossed type um, I think that's the yeah that's the buck that's the t-rex buck from the lost world and it's one of Stan Winston's animatronics. You can see it's not a maquette, it's the animatronic head. And you can see a little bit of its like finger like popping out from the side. And it says the Lost World Jurassic Park Field Guide. And it has um you know the caution tape, the yellow and black design on the top. Has a weird kind of like trapezoid triangle green or uh, behind the the T-Rex and it has that famous uh, Lost World green that like lime green with like a little bit of a uh, darker green tones within it on the inside you have the maquette of the T-Rex with a little you can see uh, an upside down Velociraptor uh, Pteranodon and a Velociraptor jaws like creeping from the side on the front on the left side of the cut of the inside cover 
Um, then you have Site B, like mesh, like, uh, you know, in the 90s they had these weird things going on, and it's like a collage that says Site B on it or something. And it says, place your photo here. And JP, Site B, Class A clearance, use extreme caution. So it, it, it it's kind of like a, a photo display on the inside. So it's pretty cool. Like I've had my photo in there before uh, when I went to Universal Studios and I was standing next to the Explorer. Um, I don't have any photo in it right now, but I'm thinking about putting a new one. Probably the one from like the one of the meetups. And then we go to the map. Now the map is really cool. Um, on one side, it's double sided. So on one side, just give me a second to open it up. On one side, you have uh, an amazing art piece. It shows Isla Sorna. And this is a, Isla Sorna from the movies. Not the one, um, not the map featured in the books or in the game. This one is, you know, the bigger looking island, not the small looking one that you see in like Crichton's book and in, in some of the games. Uh, the map itself is very detailed. It shows the village, shows uh, the hunter's camp, um, the trailers, everything. So it shows like all the sides of where these dinosaurs are living. Has the two T-Rexes at the top of the map. Uh, shows the village. Then you have the raptor's nest to the far I say far left side shows a pteranodon flying through like soaring over the map uh, you have a, a boneyard uh, triceratops pachycephalosaurs uh, parasaurolophus like sw like hanging out in the water on the far right side lower right side stegosaur family on like the medium right side and it has um i think that's a brachiosaur but it might be a, a mamanchisaurus i think i said that right i probably said it wrong um and the map is is pretty cool like it's drawn out it looks like it's drawn out probably like with watercolor no not watercolor um water c color pencils sorry and it's uh, it says Kodak premium processing on the bottom and then has the big uh, Lost World logo and it shows you know uh, foliage shows like grassland areas has volcanoes has uh, mountainsides jungle it's just an amazing map and if you, you you can have it either on this side or you can flip it and then on the on the flip side I'll catch you on the flip side you have all the dinosaurs in Jurassic Park. I mean, in the Lost World Jurassic Park. And it has a dinosaur height chart at the bottom. And it has a Pachycephalosaur at 5 feet tall. A Gallimimus at 8 feet tall. A Mamanchi yeah, it was a Mamanchiosaurus. Uh, 24 feet tall. It has a Baby Triceratops at 3.5 feet tall. Uh, Comsignathus at one foot tall. Pteranodon with a wingspan of 23 feet. Um, a baby Tyrannosaurus at three feet tall. A baby Stegosaur at four and a half feet tall. A uh, Parasaurolophus at 11 and a half feet tall. A uh, Velociraptor at five and a half feet tall. A uh, human at six feet tall, Tyrannosaurus Rex adult at thirteen and a half feet tall, adult Triceratops at is that eight and a half feet tall, and adult Stegosaurus at twelve and a half feet tall. So that's really cool. It has the size chart on the bottom, and it has like little details about each and every one of the dinosaurs that I just mentioned, and it'll show like. Um, up to 30 like for the stegosaurs it shows you how to pronounce the name so it says steg s-t-e-g o o h soar s-o-r-e us stegosaurus and it says up to 30 feet in length and it's an herbivore and it has a little fun fact its brain was just was just the size of a walnut 
and it says how much it weighed weighed up to two tons and it says what era is from the Mesozoic era um, 150 million years ago and late Jurassic period so it shows you the period the era which most of the dinosaurs were from the Mesozoic so it all them it, it they all say Mesozoic but then, some of them say late Cretaceous or late Jurassic or Jurassic or so most of them actually here say either late Cretaceous or late Jurassic most of the dinosaurs here and it's all the dinosaurs that I named um, again it has the lost world field guide in big in, in the field guide is in yellow letters with like a black uh, background um, oval background kind of highlighting the field guide and then it has the Jurassic Park Lost World um, logo again the red one um, with a white border around the yellow and yeah this this map I had it on my wall a while ago but I actually want to get it framed before I put it back up again and I want to get it kind of like a double-sided frame so like every once in a while you know I could switch it up have it one week one way one week the other way <laughs> so yeah um, let's go to our other piece for the day, which is going to be the 3D Viewmaster Viewer. Now this one here, it's a talking Viewmaster 3D Viewer. It says, enjoy 3D scenes and sounds of your favorite movies and TV shows. Real digital sound. And it says, roar. Operates on three AA, AAA batteries. They are not included, but I got the batteries, so we're good. Has a little kid looking through the Viewmaster with a smile on his face. The same lime green type of background the Lost World is famous for. Um, and it has like a film strip on the side showing many scenes from the movie. For example, uh, you have uh, Sarah with the Stegosaur. and has a cut scene. One of the scenes that were cut out of the movie shows Ludlow falling on the baby T-Rex. And that's how the baby gets his leg broken. Not everyone knows that. They know that the hunters were responsible, but it was actually Peter Ludlow, drunk in a drunken stupor, that just walked over, tripped, and actually fell on the baby. So, it's uh, just desserts when he's the one that gets eaten by the baby. Love that scene. Um, on the side has two little kids looking at the Viewmaster. On the bottom has all the copyright and um, information of where this this tool. It's actually from Tyco Industries, 1997, and it has all the other information where the company's at. I don't want to bore you guys with all that information, you know. Um, barcode on the bottom. Now, when you get to the back of the box, it says, "See and hear this action-packed adventure and its thrilling climax in these memorable ViewMaster 3D pictures and sounds." It shows you the ViewMaster, um, repeat button, cartridge lock, interchangeable cartridge, and advanced lever. I only have one cartridge, and it's just the Lost World one, so I I can't really I'm not really changing into anything else. And if there is like a Jurassic Park one or another Lost World one, I'll try to find it. But I just have this one for now. And uh, it shows uh, how to do it. it. Shows a little kid. It says just load. It shows a little kid loading the cartridge look and shows him looking through it and listen and I guess he's listening <laughs> doesn't really show if he is or isn't uh, and it says on the bottom also available gift sets and cartridges for all other favorite licenses real digital sound again so let's uh check it out so I got it over here I'm gonna see if you guys can hear the sounds okay I'm gonna look through first and I'm seeing the scene right now where Nick Van Owen is tending to the baby T-Rex with Sarah inside the trailer and Kelly Malcolm's in the background and she seems very scared. Now let's hear what it says. What is it? <laughs> if you heard that, it was uh, somebody saying, what is it? And the T-Rex noise. All right, let's switch it up. It shows the male T-Rex 
looking straight at Malcolm, doing that snarl and roar through the window of the trailer, and everybody inside the trailer completely terrified because uh, there's two T-Rexes right outside the trailer, which, you know, what's better than one T-Rex? Two T-Rexes. What's better than two T-Rexes? Three T-Rexes. What's better than three T-Rexes? More T-Rexes. That's right. I, I wouldn't mind a Jurassic Park full of T-Rexes, and that's it. Like, two hours of just T-Rex. But, you know what I mean? That, that would never happen. But, that's my dream Jurassic Park movie. <laughs> just kidding. No, actually, I'm not. Um, so, let's hear the sound for that scene. Mommy is very angry. <laughs> Mommy's very angry. Alright, let's switch to the next one. So we have the T-Rex roaring and um, it's they're breaking apart the car and they're about to have a feast for two, which we all know who that is, you know, the wishbone scene. So uh, Eddie Carr, you know, the man gave his life for ours. It's very, very sad scene. But the best death, I think, uh, it rivals Zara's. I don't know. In my opinion, I, I, I still feel like... Eddie's is the best death in the franchise, but yeah, Zara's is pretty, pretty up there. Okay, so next one. Well, we got the 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 female T Rex. She's in. I think it's a female. Might be the male. No, it's female. Uh, she's in the tent, and she's sniffing. The baby's uh, blood on the jacket, and you see Sarah with a uh, fear, a uh, face full of fear, um, trying to stay calm and quiet, while the T-Rex is like literally right behind them, like right on top of them. Really, if you think about it, it's a very uh, scary scene. And let's see, let's hear the sound for that. Don't run. Don't run. <laughs> Next one. Uh, okay. Um, this one, they're walking through the boneyard, walking towards, uh, the village. That's, uh, Malcolm, Kelly, and Sarah. Now, um, I always love that boneyard scene, because it, it goes from boneyard into, like, like, bars to get to the village. And that goes to show you how much dinosaurs the raptors actually have killed. That whole boneyard is theirs. So, let's, uh, hear that scene. It's like some birds or something. Go, go. So here we are at the village, and there's a Velociraptor um, looking towards Sarah and Kelly running towards the the shed or the one of the buildings in the village, and Malcolm is is knocking on the car trying to get its attention. Uh, very scary scene. This the scene in the village is awesome, and I love the soundtrack during that scene. All the drums and whatnot from John Williams. Incredible score. Well, let's hear what they say. Go, go. A raptor purr. And here we have the one raptor that's about to attack Malcolm, but Kelly's doing the gymnastic scene. Yeah, I'm not going to talk more about that because that scene right there is a very controversial one. I don't mind it, but I guess the rest of the world does. So let's listen to that one. I have no idea why they put that in there, but whatever. That doesn't even sound like the raptor roaring or anything. Okay, next one. <laughs> Why did that sound like Ray Arnold? Um, anyway, this one here is the Raptors like crawling through the hole that they, 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 Sarah and Kelly were digging in the ground. And uh, you hear somebody that sounds like Ray Arnold go, it's over now. <laughs> Alright, listen to that one. It's over now. Sounds like a truck too. I, I don't understand that. Okay, same audio played again, and it's like Malcolm standing, and the Velociraptor is crawling through the hole. 
And, uh, it's cool. Like, the scenes are really cool, though, guys, because, uh, they're, like, really, like, some of them, uh, they're angles that you've never seen in the movie, so it must be from, like, principal photography. Okay, so, next one. It was the same audio, but I'll play it again anyway. It's over now. Uh, we have the same audio playing. I don't know if it's glitching or something, but this um photo here is th the male T-Rex captured. It's in like capture gear, and you have Roland Tembo just uh p ready to put on his hat to. I spent enough time in the company of death. Type of scene coming up. So again, it's the over now audio. It's over now. Which I don't get. Why does it keep doing that? Anyway, right now, it's the baby um, Stegosaurus, and there's Sarah taking a picture. And one thing I forgot to mention, all these scenes right here, they look 3D. Like, uh, the way they're set up, it looks 3D as you're looking at them. So, Sarah looks like, you know I mean, everything... I don't to explain it. it. It looks like everything's popping out from the little screen I'm looking at. It's really cool. Um, and for some reason, it's playing the same audio again. So let's just keep switching. Ah, oh, cool. Here we have a really cool picture. Even though it's dark, but it it just looks really awesome. It's the baby Rex in the Rex nest. And uh, here's the audio for that. It's the Rex nest. It's the Rex nest. And here's the scene I was just telling you guys about earlier. It shows Peter Ludlow tripping over and breaking the T-Rex, the baby T-Rex's foot, or I mean a uh, leg. And Roland's just looking at him like, "How drunk are you? And why were you drinking that much?" It's awful, but it's um, it's a scene we never see in the movies, and some people d never know why the T-Rex broke its foot uh, leg. But there it is, um, Ludlow doing it. And here's the audio for that. Why does it sound like a goat? I don't know. And he here we got the gatherers looking over the hunter's nest. I mean the hunter's camp. <laughs> Sorry. And yeah, it's, uh, there's not much else on the scene going on. But it's pretty cool because it's like you're sitting there looking with them through like binoculars. And uh, here is the sound to that. That weird, like, truck dinosaur sound. And this is really cool. It's the Triceratops breaking through the tent. And uh, it's awesome to see because it's like, you know, that's an animatronic on there. It's not just a picture of, like... Most of these look like pictures of animatronics, so there's no CG pictures here. So, yeah. So here's the sound for that. And here is the gatherers and the hunters meeting up and discussing what they're going to do now that all their equipment is destroyed. So, uh, you hear this is the audio here. We have to move. We have to move. And, and now we're back to Nick Van Owen. So, it's really cool. Like, it's... I mean, I guess as a little kid... It, it, it was awesome to look at, but you need you really need more cartridges because this one finishes out real quick, and some of the audio doesn't make sense. <laughs> some of it really doesn't it doesn't at all. Like, uh, what was that? Like, one audio is just like roaring constantly, and had like Ray Arnold saying, "It's over now." I, I don't know whether they were telling me to put down the Viewmaster and just stop looking, or I, I don't I don't get it. <laughs> But, but yeah, guys, um, that was the Talking Viewmaster 3D Viewer. Cool, right? Um, it's a it's a cool item because I I've I got it off a a Jurassic Park collector himself, and you know I mean I I've never seen a Talking Viewmaster for Lost World, and it's like a whole special package dedicated to it, and. Uh, 
the Kodak premium processing um, field guide. I never had seen that either. So they're two really cool items. Uh, you might find them on eBay if you look for them. I don't know how much they go for. I know uh, the Kodak one, I have no idea because it was part of a whole dress part package that I got. And the Viewing Master, I, I got it for like, I can't remember, I think it was like 20 with an, with something else. I think it was a poster or something, I got it off the guy. Um, but he was giving me a good deal, so. Anyways, that's that's uh, the other item for um, the Lost World Celebration month. Um, I will be back with one final big item, which might be a little longer of an episode. But uh, I try to make this one shorter, but it seems that the clocks run out a bit. <laughs> um, anyways, let's just keep celebrating Lost World, guys. And if you're not out there watching Lost World, please watch it right now. Because it's, you know what I mean, this month is very special for the Lost World. Um, especially for a person like myself that loves Lost World so much. And I should be having a really cool Lost World painting showing up very soon. Um, till the next time, Jurassic fans. Stay tuned. And now let's take a listen to part three of four of the making of the Lost World. Mommy's very angry. This is the pit and snake man. No, I'm I'm simply saying that life uh, finds a way. Is that good? You find it. Fantastic. That's the part they didn't like. I believe I've spent enough time in the company of death. Hang on, this is gonna be bad. Hang on to something! Hang on to something! Early on, we were looking for a cliff top to hang the trailer from so that we could shoot them in jeopardy hanging over the cliff. So we started the sequence on stage 27, which we used to pull the real trailer using cables and winches, and it weighed 12 tons, so we had to put mud down on the ground and slide it and hold it through the roof of the stage. In fact, we cut holes through the roof of the stage and used a construction crane through the roof to hold the, the uh, trailer upright. When we moved to the outside location, we got permission from the studio to use their parking structure and build a cliffside on the parking structure. And we used cranes in that case as well, and we had to call out engineers and grand numbers on it to make sure we weren't gonna collapse the parking structure. Inside the trailer, we had rigging for the actors. They were on cables, and they were uh, safetyed off so that they could only move so far, as far as I wanted to let them move and still be safe and appear as though they were falling. On top of that, we had rain falling out there, so we had that element to deal with as well. Everything was wet, the camera was wet, the actors were wet, so we wanted to be able to get them up and down as quickly as possible and in and out of the trailer safely and still get the scene. When I say begin, you'll just be looking up at the trailer coming down around you. And when the trailer comes around you, it's interesting because it's kind of like being in an elevator. Yeah, yeah. Or it's actually okay. back to, it's being the shaft of the elevator moving. Right. And the reason you're looking all over is you don't want to get hit by the side. Yeah. And then you're going to see a big fireball go off and a bunch of flash bulbs it's go off. a big fireball too, I And that is the explosion of the de debris. a little harder you know I mean I work with somebody to kind of build my upper body strength and try to try to work on things that I need to use for hanging and for climbing and I still don't think that I was as prepared as I, I should have been or I needed to be because I, I didn't anticipate the level of physicality this would require we tried every method known to try to get the eye lines for the actors where they should be for uh, looking at animals that aren't there so we've tried tennis balls, we've tried um, any number of things, balloons with helium in them. This picture, Lost World, we came up with monster sticks, we called them, and they were cutouts of dinosaur heads. And we literally walked through the set with animal heads at the right height so the actors could get used to where their focus would be, and we would rehearse them with those sticks. That's how we keep the actors kind of looking where they should be, because there's nothing worse than once you frame up a shot, if you put a creature in one place and the actor's eye line is somewhere else or their focus is somewhere else, it doesn't work, so it became very effective for us, and we used the mods. Ah! 
In the scenes where the raptors are stalking and killing in the tall grass, Rick Carter grew a field of grass, so it took months of preparation to get it high enough, and then we got together with Stan Winston's team, made dollies and track, and built systems to carry the raptors through the grass on the angle that Stephen predetermined for us in our meetings. In some of the sequences in the grass, we had furrows already mowed down, and then that information was given to Dennis Muir and ILM, and they painted back in grass and then animated it to move with the movement of puppeteers with raptor heads. So that's a great example of how the combination of all the tools work to make one shot seamless. <laughs> We had to work with Jeff Goldblum up in the back lot because part of the time he'd be acting with nothing there. So we basically had to rig glass to break itself, car doors to, you know, dent themselves and cars to rock. Michael Antieri's group had rigged the glass and had it all set up. And it's a matter of sort of working out the timings of the shot, you know, where the camera has to be at what time in the shot, where Jeff has to hit, where he has to look and then when the, the rigging has to break, and so the glass will, will shatter and as though the raptor jumped through it, when of course the raptor is not there. So it's all choreographed to keep the pace of the scene proper so that the animal's in the right place at the right time, and you add Jeff Goldblum into that, and we have to pay, pay attention closely to his eye lines, and all of our cues kind of go off of where he's at in the particular part of the scene, and it takes a lot of timing. There were probably 12 different people hitting cues to make that work. Oh, <laughs> It wasn't just a matter of a T-Rex kind of going here where you could watch a guy with a, you know, a mark on the, on the thing. They were jump, they're jumping around. So I asked either Dennis or one of his team to play the dinosaur in a couple of rehearsals just before we went so I could get the feeling of, because this thing was going, oh, now it's here, and when I'm over here, it goes there. Well, how fast does it go? All that. So they were a little embarrassed, but they helped me out. Jeff was very interested in finding out just how this raptor is moving because he wanted his eyeline to be right, he wanted his motion to be right, and that was a lot of fun. And we could actually get in there and sort of pretend we're the raptor and walk around in the same place it'll be, and he would, he'd watch what we were doing, and then we'd be, go out, run out of there, and he would do the scene. Yeah, now, now, now you're, you're, you're pulling it into you. You gotta make it feel like there's that's pressure it. pulling it in. You're too in control pulling it in. Oh, oh. Yeah, that's good, that's good, that's good. It takes me much pressure. Yeah. Oh. yeah. Like your arm just give in, they just give out, they just give out. Oh. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Just give out. Okay. Okay, so I'll say. Oh. Even harder, even bring it in faster to you. There's a lot of weight. Oh, oh that's good. Okay, let's shoot. If anybody was <laughs> looking at this and didn't know we were about to shoot a scene, they done. would find this to be a pleasant form of masochism. Let's go. And say this. We'll practice it slow as many times as we can. The camera operator, it's very important for him to be able to hit that mark exactly right with the camera or else it'll be out of the shot. And he is like following nothing in the frame as though he's looking at something. So that's a very difficult job also. Then it comes back to us and we spend the next six months putting the animal on the shot. We had two sequences that early on in the movie I remember from storyboards that later were erased. One of them is a hang gliding sequence in which all the gatherers have backpacks that turn into hang gliders. And they are running on a field and jump over a cliff and the hang gliders open up and they fly to safety as the raptors jump off the cliff and die behind them, only to find out that there's a pterodon in the air that attacks them. And it becomes this great action sequence. That is not in the movie. As well, the ending of the movie is an action sequence that's up in the, uh, the village where everyone gets to safety in a helicopter and the helicopter's taking off and the pterodon again attacks a helicopter and his beak plows through the uh, bubble of the helicopter and is hanging on it uh, and finally the, the bird gets killed. But it's a terrifying sequence and towards the middle of the film, Stephen decided, uh, just as he did on the first film, to change the ending and, and do go for the San Diego and the bus sequence and all that, so it kind of all went 
bye-bye. We never really started uh, working on that. In all fairness to Stephen, the, the change in the third act was something that he had talked about creatively very early on, and we had dismissed it, thinking that it felt like another movie and not something that we could necessarily integrate into this. But it was an idea that often happens with Stephen that never went away. And he continued, I think, to think about it, to try to analyze how it might work into the story. And finally he got to the point where he said, you know, I just really think that this is what we need for the movie. I think it's what the audience really wants to see. As Stephen wanted to uh, kind of up the uh, the destruction factor in the movie, he, he liked the idea that as long as we were going to go to the mainland, we should ruin some things. So he had the idea of the T-Rex running down the street and wrecking the bus somehow. So I got with Randy Dutra, who does supervision on all the dinosaurs for us, and we decided how fast the T-Rex would be running and what part of his body would hit the bus, how hard and where, and kind of designed a bus that would implode itself as well as knock itself up on two wheels as it was driving. So in the plate that we shot live action, the bus tips itself up on two wheels and crushes itself in and stunt people go out the windows of the bus. Dennis then takes that film and puts the T-Rex into the scene with the computer. In the pre-production stage, uh, someone will often turn to us and say, okay guys, how should we do this? Mechanical or computer graphics or what? And it really depends on, on what we can build that won't work mechanically is sort of the stuff that we do. And we, it's nice to do the mechanical stuff on the set as much as you can because the actors can work with it, you know, the director can direct it. And it's just, it's a real win, the cameraman can light it. And we kind of know where that shift takes place, where you can't get away with that anymore and you need something else. Well, we do have to work very closely with uh, Stan Winston and Michael Lantieri and their teams uh, because our work has got to seamlessly blend with theirs. Therefore, early on in production, we visited Stan's shop, saw the creatures under construction, looked at the paint schemes along with Stan and his team. The process of creating a new creature starts with taking a practical maquette of a dinosaur and looking at the way we're going to create it as a three-dimensional living breathing looking model in the computer. This maquette here was provided by Stan Winston. Um, it's a wonderful sculpture of a stegosaurus and I would be um, one of the people that would be sculpting uh, a digital version of this. Um, I use a different medium. His sculptors probably used clay and uh, wireframes to put things together. I use wireframes as well, but it's the computer version. The network of these little yellow dots are all the points that make up this model. So if I grab one of these points and move them out, I'm actually changing the shape of this model. It's much like working with a combination of clay and chicken wire. You're pulling on these points, and little by little, you're sculpting it. And later on, the surface of this model will get textured and painted and look very real. If you make one clay sculpture, that's pretty much what you have. But in the computer, once you make something, you, there's, there's an endless number of things you can do to continue to change it. Yikes! We have a herd of these stegos going through in a scene, and so we made modifications so that uh, some would be pudgier, some would have broken plates, one would be a little baby. Animators are essentially performers, and an important part of, of getting the character of a creature down, just like an actor in a film, a lot of actors say, when they get the walk down, then they understand the character. Well, it's, it's similar to, to what we do here because when we get the walk down, the cadence of a creature, the weight shifts, uh, how he thinks, is all very important. There's no living dinosaurs, of course, today, so a lot of our references are built up off of uh, hybrids. Like with the little compies, it might be something as mundane or, or small as a chicken with some reptile movements, some quick movements or bird movements because the dinosaurs very closely related to birds. So we referenced a lot of different animals and birds. Once the director approves the choreography of what the dinosaurs are doing, then we were working in the behavior of them to make them look like, um, like a herd of animals who are kind of thinking more or less the same. Once we have this in the computer, then we have to go one by one 
and change them and kind of add a little bit of personality of each one of them so they have different attitudes and different behaviors. But just the way they're gathering and everything is the way they're coming almost like land piranha. You know, they're following her. It looks really nice. Are you looking at this? We thought that in order for this movie to... Are you hearing this? Make sure to visit JurassicParkPodcast.com to find all our past episodes, brand new news articles, information on how to contact us, and much more. It's a great source for everything related to the podcast, and of course, Jurassic Park and Jurassic World. Head to JurassicParkPodcast.com and help us build a great community. Anybody hear that? Thanks for listening to the 99th episode of the Jurassic Park Podcast. Of course, a huge thanks to Jay Jurassic for the third installment of Amber Finds during this month-long celebration of The Lost World. You know, this movie has some really awesome collectibles, so I'm glad we can showcase some of them here for you this month. Also, a big thanks to Yaroslav for the really cool remix score. It's really surprising how well everything meshed together, uh, being from all different scores. I love it. Keep it up, man. Also, thanks to Arjun for the really cool introduction to his script. I think he has a lot more in mind for that script coming up, so hopefully we can bring you some more cool details in the future. If you want to interact with us, we do most of our work over on Twitter, at Jurassic Park Pod. We're also on Facebook at Facebook.com slash Jurassic Park Podcast, and our Instagram handle is at Jurassic Park Podcast. You can listen to us via iTunes, Google Play, Podomatic, YouTube, our website, or wherever else podcasts are found. So make sure to subscribe to automatically get new episodes every week. If you haven't already, please give us a five-star review on iTunes or a great review wherever you listen to the podcast. It will seriously help out our rankings and make it easier for fans like you to find us. We're usually spotted commenting on the Jurassic Park subreddit as Jurassic Park Podcast. Don't forget to check out JurassicParkPodcast.com for all the links you heard here today. If you want to get a hold of us, you can email us with any news stories, MP3s, comments, or if you want to debut a segment of your own, send them to JurassicParkPod at gmail.com where you can submit questions directly on our website contact form. If you'd like to record something for the show, send it in to us and we'll feature it in an upcoming episode. If you don't have any way to record, you can give our voicemail line a call and leave us a message. That number is 732-825-7763. Thanks for listening and enjoy.